Hey guys, welcome to Floke, a podcast with Float where we chat with successful entrepreneurs, freelancers, and other amazing professionals that are crushing it in their game. My name is Peter, and I'll be your host on this audio journey. In this week's episode, we'll talk with Mark Lodion. Mark is a CTO and founder of Game Digit. Living the life of a digital nomad and an indie hacker, Mark is a serial entrepreneur and an expert in building products on the internet. Mark, welcome to our podcast. All right, to kick it off, Let's start with your introduction. How would your family and friends describe you? What's Mark like in everyday life? Uh, I think they would say I'm a happy person and I'm crazy. Uh, okay, why that? I'm happy because I, I try to smile all the time and crazy because whenever I got an ID that crossed my mind, I try to make it real. And sometimes it's just simple things. Sometimes it's a bit crazier. And do you have the same descriptions about you or... Would you describe yourself a bit different? You know, I think, yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty relevant. <laughs> nice. And do you think like being crazy and trying to execute every idea could be your unique skill that has helped you become successful or getting to the point where you are, where are you today? Yeah, yeah, totally. All right, cool. And can you also share us a bit about your background, like, how like a bit of your childhood, where did you go to school? Like all the major things that let you come to the point where are you today? Right. So I was born in France. I'm 29 today. Um, I was a terrible student at school. Then I went to university where I was supposed to learn how to code, but I didn't. I was learning how to party. Uh, then ended up doing a, a trip in Hong Kong for an internship. And I discovered that there's something else than just the life at university that kind of brightened my mind. And when I came back to school, I finished the studies and started to build my own projects. And that was like about six years ago. And that brought me pretty much where I am today. Yeah, I see that's quite a pattern with like entrepreneurs and indie hackers that like people are usually terrible at school or not like good learners, but then they're really good in executing their own ideas, like learning by themselves like learning by their own pace they also practice these they also do they also self-educate or was it was it all in school and then like working no yes totally like my results at school were really terrible it's a miracle yeah. that i graduated um and i i learned basically i learned everything after university on i think mostly youtube and udemy yeah yeah i know udemy as well i've done couple of courses there about marketing and yeah, YouTube, YouTube uh, and YouTube is like, you, you, yeah. YouTube is its own university right now. Yeah, exactly. Do you use any other platforms for self-education, reading any books or doing any courses? Uh, I would say technical stuff are YouTube and Google. Okay. And, and, and yeah, I read daily. I read about 30 minutes a day, all kind of books and, and yeah, more like psychology things. And I learn also languages through Italki and Enki and Duolingo. Okay, nice. And uh, would you have any recommendation for the books that you're reading every day? Like what are your mm -hmm. top top books? Um, Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker. Oh, I read this really good book. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, How to Fail at Almost Everything, but by Scott Adams. It's a really okay. good book. You, you know, you're an entrepreneur, you keep failing and uh, you don't know where you're going. That really sets you in the right mindset to keep going, keep grinding. And um, the, I think The Origin of Virtue by someone, I forget the name, but it's a book about uh, what made humans humans, what makes us what we are today. And we're not just like regular animals, but we're, we have evolved to what we are. And that was a re really big revelation um, for me yeah i read some of this book as well like i mentioned what we sleep and also those uh the last one yeah also really great books we will definitely link them in the description and yeah let's move on to the present like what did you do before starting to build your own ideas did you work for any corporate corporate or on other startups like what was your job like i've never had a job i Right after university, I started to build my own ideas. 
and just I just got a job for a couple months. Um, what was that? About a year ago, I was not really feeling well, and I was like, oh, maybe I need a change from the entrepreneurship journey. I took a job for six months. Um, maybe you know the person I work with, Ty Lopez, is a marketer on the internet. Yeah, I know him. Yeah, can you tell us about? Can you tell us a bit more about this? He's like he's a really famous person, and yeah. Yeah, it's, it, the story is pretty fun because I, I had no idea I would work for him. I applied for that company that I think the name was Genesis or something. There was nothing mentioned about Ty Lopez. And okay. then at the end of the interview, the guy said like, hey, do you want to pass a message for Ty Lopez? I was like, what? <laughs> and I ended up understanding, like I finally, they, they explained me what, you know, the company is branded under another name, but we're working for Ty Lopez. And I work with him for a crypto project. They were launching a lot of apps and things. Um, it was it was really you know interesting to to work with like very like successful entrepreneurs because you can see you know what what they do and I was impressed by how they ship fast and they kill fast like they go they ship anything and if it doesn't work they just kill it and move on to the next one and they work on like 10 projects at the same time and um, I got fired <laughs> and I get back to the entrepreneurship journey and uh, I feel much better since then and what did you do there exactly like what was your role I was a project manager. Okay, cool. Yeah, it's totally different world world when you work with people like Ty Lopez and stuff like a huge budget. Then like you can actually implement all those uh, Y combinators and lead methodology techniques when you just like create amazing products and burn it and move along. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I heard your, your motto is build cheap, earn. Uh, it's about building sh and shipping. Like, can you tell us about this? How you embody it? Build, ship, earn. Yeah, um, it's it, some some kind of that. Um, as an engineer, it's very easy to get lost into building new features and and tweaking your app so it looks better. And my feeling so far is that most apps I launch don't don't make any money, and. And it's, you can really get emotional if you spend a lot of time on something that you polish and then you end up, you know, like with nothing. So it's a, re, it's a, it's a motto. It's a reminder for me to like, Hey, you know, don't spend too much time on it, ship it, build it. And if it doesn't work, just move on to the next one. It just adds on to your portfolio. It's nice. And, and yeah, move on. Do you work alone on this project or also in teams? Only alone. Only alone. Yeah, I think I think working alone is easier to like live by this model because as soon as you add other people, uh, yeah, this can be this can become pretty tricky to like live by this model, to, like to move so fast. Yeah. And yeah, what are the biggest upsides to working on your on your own products? Um, I think it's a mind. It, it goes with psychology things. Um, I can wake up and feeling awesome, and then two hours after, I feel like I'm useless. Uh, <laughs> so this emotional roller coaster is really weird. It's hard to control it, and I'm trying to um, absorb it and let it go so it doesn't bounce back hard. I, yeah, that would be the biggest upsides. But that would be your biggest upsides. And uh, yeah, how do you? How do you conquer this? Like, how do you how do you fight those emotions? Like, do you have any tips on like day to day activities that you do to be so pro to be so productive and to keep going? Oh, you. So the question was, what what are your biggest upsides? I, yeah. I heard obstacles. No, 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 upsides. Oh, okay. Sorry for that. <laughs> I was going on no the worries. other side. No worries. Uh, yeah, I mean, the biggest of that upside is definitely for me, and this is what I'm chasing, is it's freedom, complete freedom to wake up whenever I want, work on whatever I want, and move on whenever I want. And um, and yeah, that just this is yeah, this is the number one lead for me. Okay, got it, got it. You successfully built game widgets, decision games, and already bought, right? Can you tell us a bit, uh, can you tell us about these companies a bit? And uh, which one are you most proud of? Okay, uh, so the first one I built was Viralibots 2017, working for escape room businesses. It's basically a Facebook Messenger bot that is uh, uh, entertaining the players. So you can like uh, you can basically play a mini game on inside Facebook Messenger, 
I sold it to Escape Rooms. That was the first startup that I built that made money. And up to date, you made almost $100,000. So that's pretty cool because that, that made me realize I can make a living with it. Um, okay. It crashed during COVID. And so I don't work on it because, um, you know, it, it catched up a bit, but I'm not very interested about it anymore. So I moved on. I created Game Widget, which is um, a little widget that uh, shows on your website at the bottom left and that allows visitors to play a game directly inside of your website. So you would play like an, an escape game inside of your um, a website. Okay. It's engaging and increased conversion rate by 0.5%. Um, it was, it was fun. It was fun working on it, but uh, I kind of moved, mo moved on because working with businesses, um, I, I somehow find it a little bit boring. <laughs> I need some human touch. I need to talk to you know, people constantly. And I felt yeah. like this business would not help me do that. So I moved on. I moved on and I created Habits Garden, which is um, a gamified habit tracker. Okay. It helps users build um, habits and achieve their goals by leveraging the gamification things. So you grow habits uh, to complete quests, get rewards, and, uh, and plant some little flowers. You can play with your friends. And that's probably the one I'm the most proud about, just because it's more, it's just me. Okay. <laughs> it's, uh, I have a lot of daily habits. And, uh, and that startup really feels like me. Uh, yeah, I saw on your Twitter, it has 3,000 users, right? Correct. Yeah, and was it like building Hobbit's Garden just like because you need it and then you expand it to a to product for more people? Uh, what was the key reason to like to build it? Um, I was I was bored. I had no much ideas at the time. And I was like, my my I used a habit tracker and it did not give me what I wanted. I wanted to have a calendar view of my okay. habits where you would have one day equal one square. Okay. And when you, you complete your habit, the square is green. And at, like GitHub, if, if the audience knows, like a, some people are on GitHub, the contribution board, mm -hmm. um, same thing, but for habits. And I couldn't find any habit tracker that has, that has this feature. So I just built one out of you know, nowhere, just, just for fun, nothing serious. And people liked it. Um, and so I, I just kept adding more features. How did you do it? Did you like did you snow code or did you just code it completely from scratch? I code. I only code. I don't know no code. Oh, okay. <laughs> short bit for me is coding. So uh, yeah, coding. Okay, cool. And did you did like any market research before or like competition analysis? Talk with like potential users or was just like yeah, I'm gonna do it and you just went ahead. Absolutely nothing. I just <laughs> had it. I have to build it. I built it. Okay. And have you ever procrastinated before? Yes. I mean, still, sometimes there are days within, days without. Uh, yeah. But do you think Habits Garden is now changing this for a better? Yeah. Yeah. What's changing is um, more than just the app itself is the fact that there are users who send me messages. They say they love the app. They say they would like this feature. That gives me ideas and that keeps me going. And that that okay. helps with procrastination. Okay, yeah. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Like users are sending you messages or just like just appreciation messages or also suggesting how like the product could improve? Yeah, oh. totally. So I build on public on Twitter. So there, I get lots of feedback from that. And the community, the startup community is wonderful there. Like people okay. are always checking each other. So it's very nice. And okay. within the app, um, because it's a habit tracker, people show up daily. Okay. And it's very easy for them to leave a feedback. There is a box um, for them to do though to do so. And there's also customer chat support. So I don't know, I get a couple, you know, three, four, five messages a day from people who uh, either ask for features or just send like a love message that they love the app. Um, yeah. I love it. And yeah, uh, can you expand this a bit? Like, what were some features that were added with the help of users? Um, confetti's definitely. Um, I when you complete your habit, you will throw some confetti's. Okay. People give me that ID, and I try to make it super cute. So it's uh, it triggers you know some uh, dopamine rush. 
when you're done with your habits. Um, the leaderboard, actually, that's more of my wife's feedback. She's a, she does CrossFit and she loves leaderboards. So she's like, hey, you got to add a leaderboard to your habits garden. <laughs> there we go. Um, the referral system as well. You can invite players to get more um, gems, more rewards. So I added this because the user mentioned it. And then it's just a matter of time, but I have a massive to-do list of features that users requested. Okay, nice. Yeah, building product with the community is like, I think this is the only real way how should you do it in a product like this. Yeah, yeah. Especially and since it's a game and, and when it's a game, people have, you're not, you're solving an, a global problem, but people mm -hmm. have a lot of ideas for, you know, it's like a game, there's like the field is empty. You can build so many things on it. Yeah, and I'm sure you get like a ton of ideas, but like, how do you decide which ones to include and which ones like not to include? Um, honestly, I don't, I don't really know because um, some it's really hard. I don't have a framework to decide like this. I, there is this thing that what sometimes you know I I, I dig so I check the ID. I look at what are the consequences in terms of how much time will I invest and how the product's going to change with that. Um, and then I have a gut feeling. It's either a yes or a no. It's rarely in between. Mm -hmm. Okay, I understand. Yeah, I mean, gut feeling, gut feeling is like oftentimes is a good way to go. Because yeah. like adding too many features and every feature that users suggest, it can be like never ending story. Yeah. And yeah, and can you tell us about the biggest mistakes you've learned when like from building your own product? Like what were some mistakes you did that if you look back to your younger self, you would not like repeat? And how would that you change this? How would you do it differently? It's 2016, I just graduated. Okay. I have no idea how to program. I don't know anything, literally. And then I have this idea where I'm going to build the next Tinder for sports. So it's going to be an app that's going to help you match a tennis partner or a runner. So you can go on a workout with someone. Okay. And as a perfect engineer that I am, I designed the app in my head and I started to build it, but I build it in a, in a startup, like uh, you know, Silicon Valley startup way. Okay. I make, People sign DNAs if they want to talk to me about the ideas. Like I go crazy. Like I th I'm thinking I'm the next Mark Zuckerberg. I try to build an app and I don't know JavaScript. I don't know the basics. And I learn a framework, which, which is called, I think, Ionic. Okay. So I, I'm here with like pieces of codes that I have no idea what they're doing. And I'm trying to pile them up like, like Legos to make an app. And it's terrible. Like it doesn't even work. The app has never been born, but I spent a year on this. And then on a day, I just realized like, what am I doing? And then I like, quit and I'm, I, I quit on, I, I closed that app and I moved to another country. <laughs> <laughs> I but, mean, the, the idea sounds awesome. Tinder for sports. Can you like tell us more about it? Like, how do you came up with this? I'm a, I love sport. I do all kinds of sport and I try to do two hours of workout a day. And okay. I've always felt super lonely. Like when I was a student, I would go to uh, the Alps ski resorts by myself just because I love skiing and I felt this loneliness and I was like how about you know like an app that would match people based on their skills so you find someone that is a bit like you so you can compete but uh, like a friendly competition fair competition um, that's pretty much how we came yeah so it wasn't like it it wasn't the premise wasn't like uh to like a dating for sporty for sporty people it was more like to meet people to do sports with right yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, okay, I got it. And yeah, were there some some other mistakes that you remember? Like some other lessons learned? I think no, I think I've I've got really frustrated with the time invested in in a product. Mm -hmm. And that's probably my biggest takeaway. Um, yeah, how are you um, uh, changing that? Yeah, go ahead, sorry. Yeah. So, so how do I change, um, how do I change that? I, I give myself like really short deadlines. Mm -hmm. um, do you, product Hunt, it's a site where you submit your product uh, when you're, you're ready to launch it. 
I usually give myself a deadline. I'm saying the product is going to be ready for product launch, uh, launch on, you know, in 10 days. And I have from now to 10 days to build it. And that rush creates some kind of um, motivation and that helps me, that helps me um, be productive. And, and going back to your, to your previous question, uh, the second thing I think I, I learned is that don't try to change what you're using if it works keep it as it is like don't try to change framework don't try to use a new app for this like if, if you have something that works well for you just keep using that thing get really good at it instead of trying to change try new things because you spend so much time you can lose so much time doing this so better to not launch a perfect app but just the app that's functional enough if i understand right yeah yeah there's a guy that i really admire that says there is a 24 hours version of every startup out there. So in 24 hours, you can build a Facebook. In 24 hours, you can build a Google. It can be sketchy, but it, it, it can work, right? And yeah. I use that code. I, I turn it into like a week uh, version of a startup. And I try to make all my startups within a week. Oh, okay. Got it. All right. This sounds like super intense. Like how many ideas are you launching on a monthly basis? <laughs> um, so I, I also because I work on on my other startups. Um, I'm not full time building new startups, but I would say once every week, uh, every two weeks, or once per month, I would launch a new ID, a new app, or something. And all all of them are like you you you, you don't do like market research, everything. You just build it and launch it and see how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally good feeling. Yeah, nice. I love it. <laughs> I love it. And you also call yourself an indie hacker, right? Can like, I mean, I I know the concept, but like not. But can you like explain what it is? Like, what does it mean to be an indie hacker? That's a good question. <laughs> I kind of follow the movement, and I was like, yeah, okay, I'm an indie hacker now. <laughs> uh, I guess the vision. It, um, I think it's more like uh, people who are a bit tired of you know what. Um, the regular way of doing things. So they're hacking the system by doing something by themselves and following their own path. So it's like, a, you know, it can be you and a group of friends or just you and, and you do your own thing. You do it the way you want, you do it wherever you want. Um, it goes with the remote culture, the asynchronous culture. It's probably how they describe it in my poor words. So you see, so would you say that you have been an indie hacker since like the anti university that you said that you just started building your own product or was it like, have you become this recently and like by the definition? I, I think it started, so it started right after university, but I went from, I'm going to be the next Mark Zuckerberg to, oh, I'm just a guy in my room building my IDs. Um, so the entrepreneurship thing has always been there. It has evolved to being super ambitious, to be a bit like normal ambitious. Okay. And, um, and the big difference for me was that about a year ago, I started to build in public on Twitter. So I've been in the dark for like five months, five years, working my own app for five years. Nobody have heard of it. And then suddenly I started to share, you know, the behind the scenes of what I'm doing. And that has been a, being a big game changer for me because I really started to connect with the community. I meet some other indie hackers. Um, yeah. Yeah, so correct me if I'm wrong, but if I understand this right, being like more entrepreneur is about starting your own company, like employing people and indie hacker is more like working independently, being more like a freelancer style, but building your own idea that you work on it or like few people. <clears throat> I'm not super good with definitions. I think entrepreneurship is more like a spirit. You can have it by being um, a content creator on YouTube, by being uh, a programmer that makes it, its own apps, or by being super ambitious and wanting to build the next Google. Okay. An indie hacker would be like a, a subset of entrepreneurs who okay. are living by themselves, more independent, a bit less ambitious. Okay, got it, got it. And you, you just said that you started building in public, right? Uh, yeah. Building, this is a huge thing on Twitter. We also started doing this for one of our products. And what made you do that? Like, why did you 
changed? Like before you said that you were like building in the shadows, like all alone, and then you moved to Twitter. Like, why did you make, why, why did you do it? Like, what made you do that? I think um, it, yes, it has to do with Peter Lovells. It's a really, he's a really famous indie hacker. Okay. Um, and I think he made a book called Make that I read and I was like, yeah, that's a, that resonates with me. I feel like this is the way, this is who I am. And I started to follow him on Twitter and I realized that like, he's sharing his salaries and I was like, hey, this is exactly, you know, the kind of people I want to meet and this is exactly who I am. So I was like, hey, why not following the same move? And, uh, and, and there we go. And did this help you get more leads, uh, build like build products more successfully or did it just help you meet people that, and connect with other funders and indie hackers? Both of them. Um, I get customers from Twitter. I get feedback on my products on Twitter. I get awareness from just people following the journey, even though they're not interested in the product itself. They just reshare because, you know, people are cheering each other up. Um, and I also create some connections. I met some people in real life that I, I were, you know, chatting with them on Twitter. So it's a bit of everything. Okay, got it. And do you follow any framework? Like, how do you do it? Do you like, I don't know, put up like content schedule or also going by the gut? As I say, <laughs> yeah, it's the same as I do with my apps. It's just gut feelings. I try to, um, I try to push myself to be on Twitter like 30 minutes a day. Okay. Um, Because I know that being regular, like coming up regularly, cons being consistent on Twitter seems to help. Um, so I try to, yeah, have a 30 minutes window a day where I'm on Twitter. I, I try to write one tweet and engage with the community. And, but this is probably the only framework for, if we could call it this way. And do you think like the listeners, like among our listeners, we have like a lot of aspiring entrepreneurs and people building their own products. Like what are like, what are some things that people should watch out when building in public? It's like, is there any like specificities? Um, I think at the in the end it comes down to um, how what you what you actually do because you you don't grow a Twitter account with, uh, with from thin air. You have to provide some kind of value. You can provide value directly within Twitter, like by you know helping other people reach more audience or. Or you can build a, a, a product and, and that if that product becomes interesting, then people will follow you. But growing a Twitter for the sake of growing a Twitter doesn't make much sense. It's probably the takeaway. Okay, yeah, I got it. And growing a community in Twitter is one thing, but you also said you met a lot of interesting people in real life because of it. And yeah, yeah right now you're in Bali, right? Yeah. Uh, Bali is super famous. As far as I know, Bali is super famous for like digital nomads freelancers and all those like kind of people like can you tell us a bit like that's like being in bali help you with that like do you also meet there like amazing people like people that you can connect and build ideas together or that help you build your ideas it's fun now not really because i was i was in chongu in 2018 which is a okay. place where most of digitals and like any indie hackers are and at the time i was not really going to events or, or parties because I'm, I'm a very introvert person. I, I stay home most of the time. I don't even work in, in cafes and things. Uh, so I didn't meet anyone. Then I moved to the south of Bali on the Bukit where I am currently. And this is a place where it's only for surfers. You would have tourists and surfers there. So the chances of meeting another entrepreneurs are pretty unusual. And, um, and I started to recently, I started to commit again and go back to Chongku and do, do some events. And so I'm going back at it, but I think Twitter actually brought me back to this. Okay, got it. Bali itself. Okay, got it. And do you, is Bali the only location where you live and like practice being in the, in the hacker or were there also other locations that you've been besides Paris, where you're from? I lived in Korea for about two years where I met my wife and earlier in Hong Kong for six months. Okay, and you said you're pretty introverted, so you're not really so engaged and like working cafes, but it may be like just changing the sceneries and living in another cultures help you shape like to become a person you are today and then also like to build the products like you are. Yeah, yeah, totally. 
It's a good question, actually. I think I would recommend everyone in their early 20s to go abroad with a backpack, not no money, and just figure something out. Because you, you not only discover another culture that, especially Europe and Asia, are very different. So that really opens your horizons and, you know, like, um, it's it really brought in your mind. And also the fact that you have to, um, there's no mom and dad, there's no more signs that you know on the roads. Um, the bakery is not a bakery, it's, it's a ramen restaurant. All the things are very different and you have to figure everything by yourself. So um, problem solving and also you, you get to meet a lot of people, you get to ask questions. It's a very, I think it's a very good experience for anyone. Yeah, I would totally agree on that. I, I mean, myself, I went like around the world after high school. Uh, yeah, I agree. But when you when you come back home, like at such a young age in early twenties, when you're not really developed yet, like personally, you you came back a different person for sure. Totally, yeah. And how was it like? What was it like living in Korea? Like, what did what impact did it have on like you being an entrepreneur or an indie hacker? Um, from the, living Korea is very, very different. Um, it's like a, it's a little bit like China and Japan in a way that they have a very strong culture. They don't speak much English, um, so it's it's uh, it's very different. Uh, it was it was it was interesting. Uh, the thing is, the, the startup scene is not really developed there, mm-hmm. um, so it's hard also to meet some like-minded people. Um, surprisingly, in Bali, it's way smaller, but it's way easier to meet those people. So I wouldn't say that Korea itself changed the way, you know, I do things in the business side, but it just helped me grow as a person. Okay. Yeah, I got it. And I, I mean, I heard, I'm from my experience, Koreans also like pretty introverted as well, like, and not so open for them. Yep. Totally. But the funny thing is I met my wife, she, who is Korean and, and we live here in Bali. <laughs> okay. And she's also a digital nomad. Yep. She teaches Korean and she makes uh, educational videos on YouTube. All right, nice. Yeah, you 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 briefly mentioned that you're launching your product uh, on Product Hunt. Uh, yeah, you you also launching it on Reddit, right? And can you talk about the differences in launching on those two platforms? Uh, those are very different. Product Hunt is super friendly. Pe- people will always cheer you up, and Product Hunt is made for products that are a need to, you know, that pay product. So you, you usually only get positive feedback. Reddit, on the other hand, is more like a, you know, like a, a little cafe place and you come with your product and and you say like, hey, buy my product. People don't really like it. So it's it, this is a very different way of, of launching a product. Yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in Reddit because I think like we tried doing some like subtle marketing on Reddit and I talked with a lot of people like trying to use Reddit as a like marketing or sales funnel. And it's really hard. Like using credit for promotion is super hard. Can you like share us some tips? Like how did you do it? Like some good practices? Yeah, sure. So um, I used Reddit for, to launch some apps and uh, one of them got really crazy. Like it was um, on the top page of Reddit for a couple of hours. Uh, there were like, I think 50 or 60,000 visitors within 20, within a day. So the website were in, were in pretty crazy. Um, I think it, it comes onto the community you're you're launching your product in, mm-hmm. um, and and it's like it's like a it's like a niche. So you you need to you really need to follow the guidelines of the community. You need to know their language. Um, some some communities are not like anti promotion, completely anti promotion. So there's no way you launch a product there. You just have to move on and do something else. Um, yeah yeah and did you like promote it directly like did the post and like hey guys this is my product and here's the link or did you like engage in comments or like what is the strategy behind it i have a few subreddit that i am part of and i try to be active daily as just as a user not sharing not promoting anything so it's a bit easier for me to promote products when i want um, and then if I, if I, if I were to launch an app on, on Reddit, um, yeah, I would definitely be in the comments replying. Uh, sometimes I'm, I manage to hide the promotion of the product, uh, 
on Reddit. So I would make a, like a two versions of my site. One is free and one is paid. And I will launch the free one on Reddit just to get the traffic and see what people think and to avoid, you know, getting banned because of it's a promotion thing. Um, yes, yeah, so there's a lot of very different strategies here and there based on the community you're sharing. And, and being active in a subreddit, that's like, it allows you to be like more open about it and like promote it, your stuff from time to time. It's, is it different from um, just being a lurker in the community, in the subreddit? Yeah, 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 totally, yeah. Okay, and I want to talk about one more expression with you. What is ramen profitability? <laughs> it's fun. Yeah, uh, it's a good question. It, for me, it's about $1,500, I would say. Um, yeah. It's the threshold of money you need to get every month to reach a point where the extra money, what, whatever, whatever is above that threshold is just for fun and not for the basics. Um, it depends where you live, of course. Um, but here in Bali, $1,500 1, is, is just enough. Uh, and how did you come up with that? Like, Rama, is that your own expressions or did you learn it somewhere? No, I think it's a, in the indie hacker community. It's pretty common to 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 call it ramen profitability. I think it comes down to the um, to the. Do you know what are the cup ramen? Yeah, I think it, this is started with that. Is that it's probably the cheapest and the easiest meal you can make as an entrepreneur. Oh, okay, yeah. got it. I think originally yeah. it comes yeah. from there. Yeah, I think ramen profitability goes a long way in Bali, or even longer way in other in other Southeast Asian countries. Yeah, it's a lot of ramen for one hundred one thousand five hundred. And yeah, uh, can you also tell me like an advice you would give to your younger self? Like, if you would meet yourself back when you finished university and you started launching your ideas, what would you say to yourself? Probably that everything other people tell me is just their own vision okay can you expand this a bit um i was i was a pretty super tiny kid uh, i grew up really late like when i was when i was 18 so i was the under like the the little kiddo uh, one one meter 50 centimeter like super skinny and people would call me madame like okay. they, they all think okay. i'm a girl because i had long hair and so i'll get you know all those like uh badass guys that would like make fun of me and things and when you're a kid you take these very seriously you think you know they, they're it's real right uh, and you worry and you think you overthink about it and at the end you know just things move on and and you forget it so yeah i would just tell myself that it's their own vision and, and i should not listen to them yeah totally understand and what is the best advice you ever heard and then also actually implemented to your own life I think it's it's what Peter says in his book is like, uh, sh yeah, build fast, ship fast, kill fast. Okay. Yeah. And you totally live by it, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And what's the advice for our listeners at the beginning of their startup journey or their indie hacker journey? What's like the top one thing they should look out for? What's the best advice you got? Um, the the heat the success hit rate for a startup is close to zero percent. So mm -hmm. whatever you have, whether you think it's a really good idea, it's very unlikely that it's going to be successful. So just build it very quick. And what matters is not what happens; is what what matters is that the experience you get from it. Do it in public so you get some following, and then every time you build a new product, you're going to grow your magnitude. It's is you're going to get more results with it. So. Again, <laughs> build, build fast, ship fast, kill fast. <laughs> yeah, it, what matters the most is like the journey. Like every product you build, even if every, every, every single product fails, you, you become just so more experienced and experienced that like if you keep trying and if you didn't get work, I think you will succeed at least to some degree yeah. at some point. Yeah, definitely. And to, and to like conclude this podcast today, I want to ask you like five rapid questions. Okay. So, yeah. What's your favorite book? Why We Sleep, Matthew Walker. Your favorite podcast? My first. Oh, the team first one. 
Okay, your, uh, your favorite productivity tool? Uh, as a tool, like as a software or something? Yeah, yeah. Like uh, it can also be like physical tool, like, uh, I don't know, a notebook, just like oh. the tool you use for productivity. Just, I think, air airplane mode. Okay. Uh, most used app on the phone? What's up? Okay. And your favorite hobby? Surfing. Surfing. Okay, nice. I yeah. love surfing as well. Cool, Mark. It was lovely talking to you. It was a great episode. And I hope uh, we talk again soon. Yep. Thanks for yeah, joining. Thank you for having me, Peter. It was nice.